Katie McMahon is a novelist and a GP. Her first novel, The Mistake, was published internationally. She lives in Hobart and she juggles her writing with her work as a doctor. The Accident is her second novel. Thank you so much for joining us today, Katie. Thanks so much for having me, Valerie. Congratulations on your latest book, The Accident. This is your second novel. For listeners who haven't had their had a chance to get their hands on a copy yet. Can you tell us what it's about? Sure. So The Accident looks at the lives of three women and it really starts off with the three women all at turning points in a way in their lives. We have Grace, who's a vet in her 40s, the single mum of a daughter with quite significant mental health issues, and who's finds out that her daughter is being quite severely bullied at school. And this leads her, this sets off a chain of events in Grace's life which are connected with a secret that she's got. Uh, We also have the character of Zoe, who's this friendly, bouncy teacher in her 30s whose life has been going along really quite nicely, thank you, until her partnership implodes. And our third character, Imogen, is a doctor who has recently returned to Hobart from a stint doing research overseas. And we find her desperately lonely and really struggling to cope at work uh, and in her personal life, in fact. And over the course of the book, we realise that some of Imogen's coping mechanisms are really not very healthy. And so we s- gradually these three lives intertwine and build to a climax, which is the accident. Now, Imogen is a doctor and so are you. So yes. I'm going to come back to the, uh, the novel soon, but I'd just love to give listeners some context. You're uh, a, a GP specialising in reproductive health at the moment, but you then decided one day, oh, I'm going to write a novel. <laughs> Can you tell us about when you decided you wanted to become an author? Yeah, sure. Well, I'd always loved writing and reading. And actually, when I was at school, it was really English and languages and drama that came most naturally to me that I loved. And I didn't really think that being a writer was a career that you could have. I certainly didn't know anyone who'd ever been an author. Um, My dad was a journalist and I thought, well, you know, I could do journalism because that's kind of like writing. And uh, so after I had finished year 12, I applied to RMIT to do journalism and I got in, which I was very excited about. But I thought, well, I'll take a gap year. I want to go and see the world. So I did. And while I was overseas, actually in India, I kind of had this epiphany that, oh, I would love to study medicine. (laughs) It's very different. Uh, It was very, so very different, but it was very strong and clear. And I guess inspired by that idea that I would love to try to help was what was behind that. And um, so anyway, that meant that I, of course, had to do year 11 and 12 again, because at least in those days, I'm not to be honest sure if it's still the same, you had to have, you know, a certain kind of maths, chemistry, physics, biology, all those kind of hardcore math science subjects, which I hadn't done. And so I came home to Australia and I enrolled in year 11 again um, at a different high school this time, but still at a high school where I was known as the kind of slightly weird mature age student. And I just didn't have to wear a uniform and I was allowed to just come to my classes and kind of drive my car off at lunchtime. But I did that for two years. I did year 11 and 12 again. And I had some lovely teachers actually. Uh, And then, yeah, enrolled in medicine at university and completed my medical degree. So then I worked for quite a number of years as a doctor. I became a GP and then I had time off when I had my babies. And so when it was time for uh, me to come back to work after maternity leave, 
I kind of thought, well, look, now's an opportunity for me to approach the rest of my career in quite a conscious way. What do I want to do? You know, what do the next 20 or 30 years of my working life look like? And I thought, I know, I'll ask, I'll ask a wise person. I'm a big fan of asking for advice and asking wise people for advice. A senior colleague was quite a lot older than me who'd had a very interesting career within medicine and who I really respected. And so I went along and kind of said, you know, what, what do you think? And I thought that the conversation might be along the lines of, well, perhaps you could develop your interest in, you know, women's health or perhaps you could develop your interest in adolescent health or you could do this professional development or you could go part-time or, you know, whatever. And anyway, through that conversation with this very skilled counsellor, I found myself getting all these tears in my eyes in the middle of a busy office and saying, I just really want to write. And wow. Yeah, yeah, it was, and I was so surprised that there was that emotion in me still. Um, so anyway, I decided that the best thing might be to enrol in a course. So I enrolled in a Master's of Creative Writing at Macquarie University, and I think that would have been in around 2017. And I completed part of that course, which I found extremely useful in many ways in terms of technique. Um, and it, it was mostly done online or it was all done online, that particular course. So anyway, I did that. And uh, then one day I was sitting in Sydney Airport and I was looking at the airport bookshop and it had you know, all the, the books there for people to buy. And I thought, oh, if ever I was to really seriously write anything, I would like to write something that is read. So that was a moment of clarity for me in realising that I don't want to write very, um, I don't necessarily want to write articles that are just read in obscure, very literary magazines or poetry I want to write something that is read. That was just basically a bit of a rocket of inspiration, like, look, give it a go, give it a serious try. So I'd organised my life. I mean, it wasn't just thinking, oh, I'd like to write a novel, you know, so I'll just sort of dash one off in the afternoons after I come home from work while I cook dinner, like I had set aside. I think at that stage I had two to three full days a week where I was able to dedicate them to writing. And so I just, you know, gradually over a period of probably 18 months or so developed this novel. And through that process, the first three chapters crossed a publisher's desk, Tegan Morrison at Echo, and, and I was delighted to receive a text from her saying, you know, we've received the first uh, three chapters and I love it and I'd like to see the full manuscript and she was the only publisher who had seen it so I was super excited and was still finishing um, the manuscript and and from that I got my first book deal so that was the mistake which came out in 2021 and then the accident was released this year in 2022. Brilliant. So the accident, as you've mentioned, there's these three main characters. You actually write from their different points of view. Um, so uh, Grace and Zoe and Imogen, and they're very different people and you get into their heads. Um, and But you also include, you intersperse here and there, um, very small excerpts from... Um, official documents, I guess is the best description. Mm -hmm. Some of them are like from a coronial inquest. Others are from, it's called principles of medicine. Um, it's like an official, uh, I think it's fictitious, is it? But it's, it's, it's a fictitious yeah. textbook, yes. Yes. Yeah. What made you think of that and why did you do it? Sure. Well, as you say, the story unfolds from three different characters' viewpoints and quite a bit of the story, particularly of Grace's story, revolves around events that happened to her in her 
distant past. So when she was a young woman in her 20s, she's now in her 40s. And I felt that in order to kind of anchor the book for the readers, for readers to know where this story is going, because at the beginning the women are in their separate lives. So I felt like readers needed to have a clear reason to keep going that that this these stories are all leading somewhere. And so particularly the excerpts from the coronial inquiry um, were included as an element of to build suspense that so readers know well it's not giving away a spoiler to say well someone has died and that then in each I call them the snippets in each of the snippets from the coronial inquiry a little bit more information a little bit more of a clue is divulged and with the official documents that you mentioned for example the um, principles of emergency medicine um There's less of those, but actually I put those in as a point of interest really to make readers think, for those who care to think, um, about the issue of blame and how society apportions blame, how we regard accidents, how we regard mistakes. And I feel that very often when when a person is blamed, there are very often contributory factors that have led to their error or their mistake or to the accident that's happened, um, systemic and systematic problems. So I wanted to get readers to just maybe think a little bit about that and that's part of the reason I included those. When you started writing the accident, did you know, um, well, first of all, you mentioned that you were able to dedicate two to three days a week when you wrote the mistake. Has mm-hmm. that continued now? What does your week look like now in terms of your time allocation to writing? Yeah, good question. Um, most of the year I have, I, I generally have three days a week to work, three full days a week to work on my writing. And then I try to avoid working evenings and weekends although occasionally I will if it's if there's something particular that I just really need to be in the zone and stay in the zone for. And also at certain times of the process, I will go away. So I will take, you know, three to four to five days where I go away and stay in a hotel. And I like a hotel because I don't want to be in a strange house like an Airbnb I don't want to go and stay with a friend because then I'd have to interact with them. Um, I want to be somewhere where there's sort of other people around but I don't really have to interact. And, yeah, I literally just look for a good deal and go and shut myself in a hotel room in Hobart and don't do anything else. I order room service for dinner and, and I just work all the time. For how long do you stay in the hotel? Oh, like three to four to five days, yeah. yeah. And yeah. which what at what juncture is that? What's the critical point where you decide, oh, I'm going to book a hotel now? Um, it's tends to be before the first draft is due, um, so not like right before, but maybe uh, say three weeks or so before, where I just have to give it a really good spurt of not only time, but just allow myself to totally get into that headspace and not keep coming out of the world of the book and is it written by that time and you're and you're polishing it or are you finishing it um good question I am both both Mm -hmm. actually so I'm really keep polishing right up until the end um and with this well, with the accident at least, I did, I rewrote the ending a number of times. It took me a long time to be satisfied with the ending. So with the accident, just before the first draft was due, I was, you know, writing the ending um, or rewriting it, but but also polishing. And then in that period between when I submitted the first draft and got the feedback and um, 
I was, you know, writing the second draft. I was, <clears throat> I was, I was still doing a lot of polishing and also uh, had rewritten the ending. And just to clarify, when I say the first draft, that doesn't mean my first draft that I write. That means the first draft I submit, which yes. is probably like my, you know, 3,000th draft. <laughs> <laughs> sure. So when you were writing The Accident, did you know what was going to happen? I knew that there was going to be an accident and that it would be a climactic event that involved all three characters. But, no, I didn't actually know who was going to, um, as it turns out, die. I didn't necessarily even know if someone was going to die, but I just knew that it was going to be, yep, a, a, a climactic event involving all three characters in a serious way. So you knew where it was going, mm -hmm. um, but presumably you started already knowing who your characters were going to be, or did they also unfold as as obviously the story did when as you were writing? Yep. So when I started the book, I knew that there would be the character of Grace and Zoe, and I had an inkling about the kinds of people that they were. And I find when I develop my characters in, in the two books that I've written, the way I've done it is I've just really spent quite a lot of time. So, you know, probably weeks to months, months, um, just writing into that character. So writing scenes with that character, finding out about their history, their life circumstances, their secrets, their strengths and weaknesses and joys and sorrows and so on. And then a lot of that gets discarded because it's not necessary for the narrative, it's not necessary for the reader to know it, but it's necessary for me to know it. So I consider that like research. I sort of think if I wrote historical fiction, I'd go away for months and, you know, look up books and, and, and other references to learn about a historical period. Um, so I really wrote in, I was writing a lot into the characters of Grace and Zoe and getting to know them. And then the character of Imogen kind of happened onto the page and it was, I, I was writing a scene with Zoe in it and then I became aware that there was this other woman watching Zoe and I started to see Zoe and see that scene through Imogen's eyes. And it quickly became clear to me that Imogen um, was going to be a really important character in the book and I started to see how she might fit in. And then I did a lot of work understanding Imogen and, and developing her voice as an intelligent but also socially awkward voice. And so are you currently writing your third novel? No. Um, well, I keep saying no and then going, but, well, I'm, I'm taking notes, I'm making notes and I'm having ideas, but I haven't seriously sat down to write. I've actually been just really busy doing stuff for the accident um, and just kind of regrouping and having a little rest. <laughs> and when you are, um, uh, you know, busy writing and you're juggling your writing and your work mm -hmm. as a GP, when you're doing the GP work, are you... Are you do you compartmentalize easily, or are you constantly thinking of you know of everything? Is it a bit of a blend? Yeah, no, I do compartmentalize, and I need to. Um, they're both very demanding. In that you know, when you're writing, you really have to have your head in the book, and when you're when I'm at work. As a GP, my head's completely there and what I'm doing in what I'm doing. And actually what I've realised and part of the reason I'm taking a break now is because even though on paper, time-wise, it sounds okay, like, yeah, you can do, you know, medicine for one or two days and you can do writing for three days, they both um, necessitate an enormous mental load and that is very difficult. So I'm just working out going forward how I will 
you know, balance those and if it's possible. So, um, all right, so you just said that you're going to work out the how, Mm -hmm. but um, my question is what is the Grandmaster plan? Forget about the how. What would your ideal situation be? What kind of mix? Mm, Such a good question, Valerie, and that's what I'm asking myself really. (laughs) I mean, the elephant in the room is money, right? Um, So I don't think it would come as any surprise to anyone to think that working in medicine, although it's probably less well-paid than a lot of people think, it it is a secure job. And once you leave medicine, it's very difficult to get back in because you have to keep up with it. You can't just think, oh, I'll take a year or two off medicine and see what happens. You know, you registrate, you have registration requirements and so on. Um, and notwithstanding that, sometimes I, just, I think to myself, if, if, I, if I was given a billion dollars tomorrow, what would I do? Would I just, you know, not work at all? Would I work full-time in writing? Would I work full-time in medicine? What would I do? And I don't know that I would leave medicine if I had a billion dollars. There's so much that's wonderful and rewarding in it. And um, and to be honest, I also think, well, you know, the taxpayer paid for me to train in it. It's good to try to make use of that. Um, <clears throat> but then to leave writing would be be awful and I don't think I could actually like I'll always yeah like I know I can't do that either fair enough (laughs) okay (laughs) watch this space to see what you end up deciding all right fantastic what was the um most challenging thing about writing the accident and what was the most rewarding the most challenging thing was navigating the structure because as you say, it's written from three different perspectives. So it was really important that the reader would know enough about each character to stay involved with her, to engage enough with her story, but also not get so into one story that you kind of forgot about the other two stories. And just getting the timeline right, that if, you know, a month passes in Grace's life, you can't really come back to Zoe's life and only a day has passed. So um, I began to really appreciate other work that had been written from multiple viewpoints because when I read certain books like that, This Charming Man by Marion Keyes springs to mind, it just seems to flow pretty seamlessly and effortlessly between all the different characters and you're like, oh, God, it's actually so hard to juggle all these timelines. Uh, So that was the most challenging bit. And the most rewarding bit, it was a challenge, but it was really rewarding, was developing the three characters' voices. I really enjoyed getting to know each of these three characters. I actually had love and empathy for all three of the characters. And I enjoyed the technical challenge of giving them each their own verbal kind of quirks, their own own type of vocabulary, their own cadence with their speech, their own perceptions of their environment or the weather. You know, Zoe's always happy and embracing of the beautiful sunrises and the gorgeous sky and Imogen's always talking about the traffic fumes and the looming mountain that she feels like it's watching her. So I really enjoyed that. And finally, what would your top three tips be to aspiring writers who also need to do this juggle, a demanding other job, but also the desire to write a really good novel? Mm. What are your top three tips on how they can achieve that? Well, I think you really have to take your writing seriously. I mean, I don't think that writing a novel is something you can just think, well, I'll juggle it in to, you know, the rest of my life and not sort of give up anything. Um, I spent a lot of time 
manoeuvring myself into a position, like years, getting into that position where I could have the two to three days to write. So I guess to summarise that tip, it would be preparation and taking it seriously and recognising that you're going to have to give other stuff up. I mean, I didn't have any other hobbies or really interests, <laughs> um, you know, social things were let go of and so on. So take it seriously is really the first, is, would be that tip. Um, and then I think just in general for people wanting to write is, is to read and reread. I mean, isn't a wonderful thing about aspiring to write that we're just surrounded by all these wonderful examples that are usually really entertaining of how to do it. And I also would recommend, you know, reading how-to books or, or doing courses, um, but definitely reading and rereading. I never quite relate to myself personally. You know, sometimes I'll see like the 50 book challenge and it's, you know, read 50 books in, you know, three days or something. Because for me, the process of reading is very much about getting right into the book and really engaging with it rather than rushing to the end so you can move on to the next one and sort of tick it off. And to that end, as, as with my writing hat on, I also find rereading very helpful because the first time I read a really good book, I'm just totally swept along by it. But then on the rereads, I can ask myself, more about, well, why was I so swept along? What's working here? How has this character developed? How is the plot unfolding? What's she done with setting? How's that dialogue? Ah, and start to just notice the techniques. So you're reading analytically, yeah. Yeah, so reading analytically and critically. And actually, even if I'm not enjoying something, that's almost more instructive. Yes. If I notice I'm losing interest, I'm like, oh, well, why, you know, why am I losing interest? And if I'm losing interest a bit but I'm keeping going, then, well, what's keeping me going? You know, is mm. it a plot point? Is it that i am got a hope for the character or a fear for the character? Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, so reading and rereading would, would be my second tip. And um, my third tip, well, would, just, would actually just be writing and rewriting so when I say writing, I, th I think with your first draft, so I don't mean your first draft that you show someone else. I mean your first draft, you're literally your first draft the first time you write to just I think it's good to be very free with that, to have pretty low expectations of it, to allow it to be pretty crap, to accept it probably will be pretty crap. Um but, you know, a good saying I heard once is you have to dig through the mud to get through the gold, to get to the gold rather. You have to um, write your way in, I think. But then you must, of course, you must rewrite. So you must take things out, look critically at your work, work out where you need to develop it, Ask yourself, where should this story actually start? It, usually the story that you want to show someone else doesn't start with, well, for me it doesn't, it's the thing I wrote. It might be the thing I wrote, you know, six weeks in or, or more in. Um, so there must be that critical reappraisal of your own work and, the really trying to make it good. Yep. Brilliant. Thank you so much for sharing that insight and congratulations on the accident. And thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks a lot, Valerie. Really lovely to be here.